antibody structure. Now later in the video, in the last slide, you'll see the action of antibodies and how they work in terms of agglutination, which is when a large antibody binds to a, a number of different pathogens to prevent them from entering a cell or moving through host tissue, and neutralization, which means um, a number of smaller antibodies cover the pathogen binding sites and prevent pathogens from entering a cell. But this part of the video will be talking through the structure of antibodies. Now the first thing to know about antibodies is they're made of four separate polypeptide chains. You've got one, two, three, four chains, and they're held together by these disulfide bridges. Now the two smaller polypeptide chains on the outside, here and here, are called the light chains, whereas the other two chains here and here are called, surprise surprise, the heavy polypeptide chains. And you can see a bend in the polypeptide chains here. And these joints hinge regions. And these hinge regions actually work just like hinges. And they allow the opening and closing of the top part of the antibody so that the um, antibody can actually bind to more than one antigen. Now in simplified diagrams we sometimes see the uh, antigen binding to the antibody here but actually the binding sites are here and here and these are the antigen binding sites and that's how it's possible for these antibodies to bind to more than one different antigen. Now you might also notice the V's and C's on the diagram so that's a C, C, C and C and the V's are there. They stand for either the constant or the variable region of the antibody. So the majority of the um, antibody is made of a constant region, which doesn't really change structurally, because in all antibodies, it's the exact same structure. Whereas the variable region varies between different, different antibodies, which can attack different pathogens, because they have a different amino acid structure and therefore a different tertiary structure. And of course, because it has a different structure, that means different antibodies are complementary to different antigen shapes. And one antibody that can bind to one antigen cannot bind to a differently shaped antigen due to its variable region having a different amino acid structure. Describe the actions of B lymphocytes, T lymphocytes, and macrophages. Now in the blood, there are two main groups of cells there are the white blood cells, or leukocytes, and the red blood cells, or erythrocytes. And the immune system centers around the leukocytes, or white blood cells. Leuco is the prefix for white, and erythro is the prefix for red. And of course, cytes, or cyto, means cell. Now we can break the group of leukocytes down into two further distinct groups of white blood cells. There are the lymphocytes, and they're called lymphocytes because you find more of them in the lymph. And there are also the phagocytes, which are responsible for mainly phagocytosing the bacteria. Now there is also a third group, which we can call other today, because there are some more specialised leukocytes that deal with things like inflammation, but we don't have to know about those today. Now there are two main groups of lymphocytes that you need to know about, and those are the B cells or B lymphocytes and the T cells or T lymphocytes. And B cells are uh, undifferentiated, and when they differentiate into more specialized cells, they can either form plasma cells or B memory cells. Now there are also two categories of T cells. Uh, there are T helper cells or TH cells and there are T killer cells. Now the phagocytes also have two main types of cell within that group but actually those two types of cell are related because one's mature and one's immature. And the immature Phagocytes are called monocytes, which tend to be small, and the mature phagocytes 
are often called macrophages, which tend to be much larger. And both of those can undergo phagocytosis, and that's their main form of defence. Okay, so we're going to have that main shot in the corner, which will help us to explore the functions of each of those main types of cell. Now the first type of cell that bacteria will tend to meet when they infect your body are actually the uh, phagocytes and more specifically the macrophages either in your blood, in your tissue or in the lymph system when the tissue fluid drains away. And when a macrophage randomly happens to bump into a bacteria, the receptors on the macrophage surface may have a complementary fit to the um, antigens on the bacterial outer cell wall. And if the macrophage recognises the bacteria as being non-self or foreign, it will then phagocytose the bacteria via endocytosis. And we call that process phagocytosis. Um, and once the bacteria has been completely engulfed, the white blood cell will digest the bacteria leaving behind the antigens from the bacteria. And these antigens are then exported and presented on the outside of the macrophage cell membrane. And it may become an antigen presenting cell. And that means it's presenting the antigens of the bacteria so that other cells can detect them much quicker and then initiate a response. And the B cells and T cells have receptors on their surface which when they bump into the macrophage will bind com in a complementary way to the antigens on the surface of the antigen presenting cell and that response is initiated. The T cells come in two types as we said earlier T helper cells and T killer cells and T helper cells act as signal um, generators because they release chemical messengers called cytokines and these cytokines can do two main things. The first type of cytokines that are released can um, increase the rate at which macrophages um, phagocytose foreign bacteria and they also release cytokines to stimulate the growth and production of B cells and their differentiation into either plasma cells or B memory cells. Now, macrophages also release a type of cytokine called monokines. And monokines are very important because they attract neutrophils by a process called chemotaxis, so that neutrophils can help to um, destroy the foreign threats. And monokines also amplify the process of B cells um, differentiating and releasing antibodies. So once detecting a bacteria, these cytokines speed up the immune response and make more and more cells act in a similar way. Now T killer cells perform a very different function. T killer cells work on internal infections of cells, for example, cells that are virally infected or infected by a uh, intracellular uh, parasite. And they also act to kill cancerous cells that may have mutated out of control. And they do that by the fact that a body cell that is infected by a virus or that has cancer will produce proteins that are not normally on a healthy cell surface. And these T killer cells can detect those abnormal proteins or antigens. And if it detects a change in a cell's antigens, it will inject the cell with hydrogen peroxide or H2O2 and that causes the cell to undergo a process called apoptosis which is basically a controlled cellular suicide. So the cells will be destroyed um, and therefore the viruses inside the cell will also be destroyed or if it's a cancerous cell it prevents it from dividing and spreading. Now B cells have two main groups and those are plasma cells and B memory cells and the plasma cells produce antibodies and these antibodies are vital for the process of neutralization and agglutination 
to prevent the spread of um, pathogens, but they also cause a process called opsonization to occur, and that is when um, they mark cells so that macrophages can more easily phagocytose them. And because it takes a long while for the body to start producing the appropriate antibodies based on the plasma cells that are needed, um, memory cells are also produced, and this happens after clonal selection and clonal expansion, which we'll mention later, um, to remember the particular plasma cell that produces the correct antibodies for that particular infection by that particular pathogen. So the next time you get the same pathogen, the body should produce antibodies much faster and much quicker to kill it earlier. And T cells also have memory cells which work in a similar way. So the memory cells are really there to ensure long-term immunity to pathogens. And it's important to remember that the cytokines are the um, chemicals released for cell signaling and they require um, the release of certain cells and then receptors on other cells detect them which causes those cells to either um, proliferate or differentiate faster or phagocytose more quickly and that will speed up the immune response. Now we'll briefly go through the uh, different steps involved in the immune response. Step one, infection and reproduction of pathogens. Now this is an obvious one, but uh, if you're infected by a pa um, pathogen, for example through an open wound like a cut, or from um, food poisoning, if the pathogen enters your bloodstream, it will start to replicate. There's a uh, bacterial pathogen, and there are the antigens on its surface. It starts to replicate, in this case by binary fission, and within a very small space of time, a single pathogen will replicate to form many versions of itself, exponentially. Step two, presentation of antigens. Now in the blood or in the lymph, if a macrophage encounters a foreign threat, such as a bacteria with antigens on its surface, it will try to phagocytose or engulf it if it recognizes that bacteria as non-self. So as it surrounds the bacteria with the cell membrane, it traps it inside a vesicle and other vesicles called lysosomes containing digestive enzymes are released by fusing with that vesicle and it breaks the bacteria down into its antigens. And these antigens are then presented on the surface of the cell. And it's now known as an antigen presenting cell. Step three, clonal selection and clonal expansion. Now there may be many different types of T helper and T killer cells. These three are examples of T helper cells and they may have different receptors. So there's a triangular shaped receptor, complementary to a, a triangular shaped antigen. There's a semicircular receptor, complementary to a circular antigen. And there's a square shaped receptor, complementary to a square shaped antigen. And if these T helper cells happen to bump into an antigen presenting cell, or the pathogen itself, only the T helper or T killer cell with the correct receptor will recognize the foreign pathogen threat. So in this case, these T helper cells will not recognize a threat because they have the wrong receptor for that particular antigen for that particular pathogen. Whereas this T helper cell happens to have a complementary fit on its receptor to the antigen and it would then therefore connect to either the antigen on the antigen presenting cell or the antigen on the actual pathogen. In the case of a T killer cell of course it wouldn't connect to an antigen presenting cell or a pathogen normally it would actually connect to the antigens presented on your own body cell to see whether or not the uh, virus infection is happening inside the cell. And once that particular T cell detects the antigens, it is selected to be the best T cell to be able to fight that particular antigen. So we call that clonal selection. And once the T helper cell is selected, it then starts to divide by mitosis and make copies of itself. And this process is called clonal expansion. And this allows the build-up of a lot of 
the effective T helper cells and T killer cells to fight the particular infection uh, so they can therefore start to attack the pathogens or infected cells more quickly. Now once clonal expansion happens these T helper cells will produce um, cytokines called interleukines as part of cell signaling and they stimulate the proliferation or differentiation of the T and B cells. So they speed up the process of making more copies of the cells and differentiating them to the appropriate type of cell, for example, memory cells or plasma cells. Now, as you mentioned earlier, macrophages can release a type of cytokine called a monokine. And also, macrophages, T helper cells and B cells can also release interleukines. And the monokines stimulate B cells to differentiate into um, B plasma cells to release antibodies and interleukines likewise stimulate both B and T cells to proliferate by making more copies themselves and then differentiate into appropriate cells. Now B cells will not produce any antibodies because they're undifferentiated but once they receive the um, cytokines and respond to them after clonal selection and expansion they will then differentiate into B plasma cells and we can sometimes just call those plasma cells on their own and these plasma cells will have the capacity to produce antibodies and likewise some of the B cells become um, B memory cells which persist inside the blood after the infection has been destroyed in order to make the process happen more quickly in future um, infections of the same pathogen. Now we've mentioned already that T killer cells um, can recognize specific antigens found on either um, cells infected by a intracellular pathogen like viruses or malaria or they can recognize um, unexpected antigens produced by cancerous cells that are replicating inappropriately to form tumors. And when they recognize these cells, they release hydrogen peroxide or H2O2 into the cell and this causes the cell to undergo apoptosis. And of course that's only possible really after the signaling of the T helper cells to activate T killer cells and cause pr proliferation and expansion. And likewise, the plasma cells, which are differentiated B cells, are clonally selected to ensure they produce the correct antibodies and they have um, clone expansion, which causes many copies of these cells to form. And antibodies are released, which can either cause neutralization, whereby the antigens surround the bacteria completely. which covers their binding sites and prevents them from entering cells. And that's called neutralization. Or larger antibodies can connect to multiple pathogens where one central antibody can connect to many pathogens and prevent them from entering host cells or moving through tissue. And that's called agglutination. And finally, T memory and B memory cells remain present inside your blood, provide immunological memory so that if the same pathogen infects your body a second time round, clonal selection and clonal expansion happen much more rapidly and therefore you will then have fewer symptoms over a shorter period and possibly you wouldn't even become ill from that pathogen. For example, um, someone who catches chicken pox from the younger will be unlikely to catch it um, and suffer symptoms again in the same way.